Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of Metcalf Institute's 24th annual public lecture series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf's executive director, and really thrilled that you are joining us today. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We approach this holistically, offering science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers, educators, and practitioners from across the country to make science communication more inclusive, equitable, and intersectional. The next Inclusive SciComm Symposium will be held virtually this October, and we urge you to learn more about that by visiting the link in the chat. Each year we focus this lecture series on a particular theme. This year we're looking at solutions to climate change that center justice and equity. Climate change is already having starkly disproportionate impacts on low wealth communities and communities of color around the world. These inequities have inspired a range of innovative solutions that involve partnerships between researchers, communities, government agencies, nonprofits, and the private sector. Over the course of this week, we'll hear from experts in science, journalism, and policy who are actively centering equity in their efforts to address climate change. Their specific solutions vary, including grassroots organizing, technology, applied research, and strategies for reporting on climate change, which brings me to today's lecture. Whether you're looking at climate justice specifically or environmental justice more broadly, it's important to acknowledge that those experiencing the injustice are often left out of mainstream conversations about solutions. For example, we'll hear later this week about some communities that are taking matters into their own hands to drive the needed changes, but we don't often hear these stories of action and agency in climate change reporting, especially in stories that highlight communities of color. Maybe that's partly a function of who is doing the reporting. According to the Pew Research Center, only about 25% of newsroom employees are people of color, even though racial and ethnic minorities make up 40% of the US population. As Soledad O'Brien wrote in an opinion piece last year, quote, the thin ranks of people of color in American newsrooms have often meant us and them reporting, where everyone from architecture critics to real estate writers from entertainment reporters to sports anchors talk about the world as if the people listening or reading their work are exclusively white, end quote. This also summarizes the situation with environment reporting. Today then, we'd like to reflect on the responsibilities of journalists and ensuring that a more diverse range of stories is told, first of all, and also that they're told in ways that highlight community agency and concrete solutions. For all of these reasons, we are thrilled to welcome Mr. Van Newkirk II today to share, oops, to share his, uh, his perspectives on the failures of news media to explain climate injustices with context and empathy and the systems that have allowed these failures to occur, including the false panacea of quote unquote objectivity in journalism. Mr. Newkirk is a senior editor at The Atlantic. He began his career as a health policy analyst for the Kaiser Family Foundation. He started freelancing at that time, ultimately getting hired as a writer for Daily Coast, where he contributed pieces that explored the intersection of policy, race, class, and culture, with a particular emphasis on justice and health. As senior editor of The Atlantic, he's covered the battles for voting rights since the 2013 Shelby County Supreme Court decision, the fate of communities on the front lines of climate change and disasters, the Black vote in the 2018 and 2020 elections, and he wrote the September 2019 cover story for The Atlantic on Black land loss. He also hosts the podcast Floodlines that explores narratives about race, class, and climate in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And by the way, was hailed as one of the best or as the best podcast of 2020 by no less than Terry Gross. His forthcoming book, Children of the Flood, A Chronicle of Black America's Fight Against Climate Crises will be published by Random House. Outside of his work at The Atlantic, Mr. Newkirk has been featured as a guest on episodes of The Daily Show, NPR's All Things Considered, and others. He co-founded the news media website Seven Scribes, a website and community dedicated to promoting young writers and artists of color. And he was selected as a 2020 11th Hour Fellow at New America, a 2020 James Beard Award finalist, and he received the 2018 American Society of Magazine Editors Next Award for journalists under 30. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to turn the mic over to Mr. Van Newkirk. 
Oh, well, um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sunshine. Um, I should probably update my headshot in the uh, materials I sent you because I believe a, a few things have changed in this uh, last pandemic year. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so uh, we can um, all refer to the PowerPoint that I'm going to be working off of. Um, and uh, I think that'll do it. First of all, um, I want to thank, again, I want to thank Sunshine, Karen, Margaret, and all the good folks at the Metcalf Institute and University for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Uh, I thank everybody for making it out, for being on Zoom. Um, it's a very nice day outside here in Maryland. So uh, if it's as nice where you are, I really appreciate you uh, spending time in front of the computer instead of running outside. Um, it's been a year, over a year of doing uh, these, for me, of doing these Zoom lectures and I've never quite gotten used to it but I hope I can provide something that is useful and worth your while. Um, as you can see from the title of the PowerPoint, I've been specifically thinking about climate justice and journalism about climate justice. Um, those are things that I hope I can get better definitions on later, uh, talking about the role of the media and covering and figuring it out. Uh, but since I am a journalist and this will be about uh, headlines and about the ways that uh, we have handled uh, climate change, environment, environmental problems, uh, catastrophes and disasters, and how we've done them uh, not so well in my opinion, I want to start with by throwing out some headlines and news quotes out there, kind of free association style, and I promise it'll make sense soon. So here we go. Heavy rains raise river. Weather Bureau advises of rising stages. The levees are better and stronger now than at any time in history. Government engineers are confident that government levees will withstand the floodwaters. As for the high water situation, both state and federal engineers give us reassuring reports. The levees are in better shape than they have ever been. There is no reason for alarm in New Orleans. Wall of water south is very dangerous. Louisiana waits with fear and foreboding. Charges of race discrimination are being rumored. Refugees herded like cattle. Conscript labor gangs keep flood refugees in legal bondage. Black people are being isolated in refugee camps where they are being held virtually prisoners under the supervision of National Guardsmen. What we are seeing is modern day slavery. Now, these are all real quotes and real pieces of news from a single major disaster in American history, not from Hurricane Katrina or anything that happened in most people's lifetimes. So, rather, these are all from the great Mississippi flood of 1927, which was one of the most devastating catastrophes in this country's history. Over the course of late 1926 and 1927, really unprecedented rainfall uh, all up and down the entirety of the river caused increasingly intense flooding along its entire length. Things got really bad in early spring toward the lower part of the river in Mississippi and Louisiana. All that rain has been raining for months and months upriver, uh, kind of flowed down and drained down the length of the river and into it from tributaries that were also flooding which sent a massive amount of water through the Mississippi Delta and toward New Orleans, overwhelming levees that were simply not built for this kind of event. Now, if you know anything about levees in New Orleans, Louisiana, they've been in the news. They were in the news during Hurricane Katrina, which I covered in floodlines. Um, you might've heard about 1927. It might've heard about the fact that business leaders in New Orleans decided to dynamite a levy in a poor neighboring community to try and save themselves from the flood by sacrificing their neighbors to the flood. If you've ever learned about this event and everything that happened, then you understand the cultural motifs and myths that have been passed down through this event, um, through the blues, through family history, into our understanding of events like Hurricane Katrina, into uh, why people believe that the levees were sabotaged during Hurricane Katrina, into our understanding that uh, environmental problems and catastrophes are always, in America at least, partly human-made and human-exacerbated problems. 
But one thing I'm particularly interested in in this period is uh, what happened after the floods of 1927 and just how media metabolized that time. You see, back then in Jim Crow times, most Black folks in America lived in the South. And there were huge Black population centers uh, near old plantation hubs in Mississippi and Louisiana. In fact, Mississippi, up until the Great Migration, was a majority Black state back then. When the levees started breaking along the river, it was absolutely devastating for Black communities that had been there since slavery. Not only did a lot of them live basically in the same places where their ancestors had lived for generations, uh, they often lived in the same houses, in ramshackle housing, in what we call shotgun houses, in huts and shacks that simply could not hold up against flooding. Uh, the spring saw some 200,000 Black people stripped of their homes and displaced. They were called refugees, and they were sent to live for months and months in relief camps that were funded by organizations like the Red Cross. And that's a, a good picture of the kinds of places where people lived for months and months. That is a, a refugee tent encampment in Vicksburg in May of 1927. Going to those camps was not the end of the misery for those folks. And that's actually really where the story that I'm talking about begins. Keep in mind that 1927 was just over 60 years after the end of slavery. And again, most Black folks around there still lived where their uh, ancestors, where their enslaved ancestors had lived. Lots of those enslaved ancestors were not really ancestors, they were living. Um, and lots of those Black folks around those parts still worked as sharecroppers. Um, they were tightly tied to plantations and plantation owners. And I don't think anybody would declare their situation as, as far as labor went as totally free. Uh, when the flood started and when the levees were threatened, Black men were impressed into service, were forced to risk their lives to fix the levees. And some of the stories you'll read about how they fixed them, some of them actually literally put their bodies into the levee breaches to stop the water with their own bodies. Um, essentially in the camps and otherwise, black people in this period after the flood were re-enslaved, forced to do manual hard labor for the bosses who ran the camps. They were beaten for laziness. They were brutalized by police and local enforcers. Black women faced rampant sexual abuse and lots of people were just killed. We don't know how many people were killed because they did not keep accurate counts. Uh, Red Cross workers and government officials, they schemed to make these Black people into a compliant labor force and explicitly spelled out the use of brutality and starvation to do so, all with the explicit approval of the U.S. government and the U.S. president. We don't really know, again, how many people died or how many people were, were left missing, how many homes ended up uh, never being rebuilt and how many people were permanently displaced. Uh, but the event was so traumatic that according to lots of historians, uh, as it was memorialized in Black folks and as it was uh, passed down in, in family lore, it was a major catalyst for what we call the Great Migration. It may have kicked off the mass movement of Black people from the South out to the North and West. It was just that bad. So this obviously was a, you know, an epical moment for Black folks. One where both present and historical racial environmental injustices came together in this whirlwind of history of displacement, suffering, and exploitation. But, and here's the media critique, if you only read the mainstream newspapers, uh, you know, back then white newspapers, you would likely know next to nothing about those dimensions of that flood at all. White newspapers, they alternated between painting the black victims as violent, as looters, as criminals, or as beggars who were unwilling to work, who created a burden on well-meaning charities and government. So how they presented it was that the treatment of Black people in camps wasn't abhorrent, it wasn't all that bad, it wasn't even anything to, to pay a whole lot of attention to. It was, when it was mentioned, it was presented by mainstream massive newspapers as a necessity for keeping the peace and for countering the natural laziness of Black victims of that flood. And that was when it was covered all. Most of the time it wasn't covered. 
Now, this wasn't how all the papers presented it, however. There were some places that did it right, and they were Black newspapers and wire, news, wire services such as the Associated Negro Press and the Chicago Defender. This headline you see here is from the Defender, and it's laying it straight in a way that uh, mainstream outlets were really uh, rarely doing at the time. Uh, this, essentially, the, the record that we've taken from Black newspapers is how we even know about uh, the events all the brutality that happened to Black people in those camps at all. One article plainly calling the, the situation uh, slavery, and that's one that I quoted up above, it was written by Ida B. Wells, who you all might know um, as a famous uh, Black investigative uh, journalist who's mostly known for covering lynchings, but considered this event so important uh, that she was getting the firsthand descriptions from people on the ground and was one of the first and only journalists to call what was happening in terms of forced labor in these camps, slavery. Other journalists in Black publications often expressed despair at how easily these atrocities were whitewashed in national newspapers. And it's actually their efforts. They were the ones who were being the muckrakers, who were going out and calling the politicians, who were calling out the president, who were calling out his cabinet members um, for their treatment of Black Americans in these camps. They were the ones uh, who got those politicians to try to address some of the conditions on the ground. Um, and for the most part, you know, I think their efforts fell on deaf ears in mainstream audiences. Now, you know, I love history and my dad's an historian uh, and I'll read his three books about this stuff all the time. I promise you all, this is not a strictly a history lesson. Uh, I just think the context is important for, for talking about what I want to talk about. Uh, reading up on 1927, you'll never go wrong if you look at the, the good books about this. Um, but what I hope to illustrate here is something that is central to the rest of my presentation. We all know the media has struggled, to put it lightly, in accurately describing issues of racial justice and injustice. That's now, that's 60 years ago, that's 100 years ago. If you were paying attention to this, the centennial anniversary of the Greenwood Massacre in Oklahoma just a few days ago, then you probably know that well. The only reason we know about that disaster, <laughs> that massacre, was because of Black journalists. But I think journalism and the other ways that we create and maintain a historical record are also intentionally bad at describing and understanding one particular aspect of disasters. And that limitation tends to do, tends to dovetail with limitations regarding speaking truthfully and plain, plainly about race. The media apparatus in America is simply not built to seriously behold and describe inequality during and after disasters and the social conditions that created those inequalities. So you can imagine that when it comes to trying to be serious about the inevitable unequal environmental burdens borne by, us, by Black folks in disasters, by Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other people of color, journalism is just has always been out of his depth. Now, I know all the people who have logged on to this Zoom, I know you're all a really sophisticated group of folks. You all know about environmental justice and equity and understand that poor people, people of color, queer folks and women tend to shoulder most of our global environmental burdens and also tend to have the least access to desirable environments and benefits. You all know that um, it is something that has become kind of the bedrock, the foundation for having real talks about climate change, about environment and justice in recent years. It has been fun seeing uh, that become more and more mainstream understanding. Um, if I look at where I was, the journalism I was doing just five years ago, this was certainly not the case. <laughs> um, but I want to make sure that I do have some basic understandings and definitions established before I get back to the, the media argument. I know we're all familiar with the term environmental justice, which for all intents and purposes here means the degree to which environmental benefits are equitably distributed uh, by race, gender, sex, class, age, and disability status, and the degree to which environmental risks are both equitably distributed and equitably diminished. You might also know the term environmental racism, which was actually coined during the protests in North Carolina in the photograph in the slide here. That's after North Carolina in 1982, 
Um, those are people protesting against a uh, hazardous waste landfill. And it's not too far away from where I grew up. So I'm always proud to show that picture off. Uh, that's North Carolina for you. Uh, but I define environmental racism by bouncing it off of environmental justice. It's a steady state in America and the world where environmental benefits and risks are at least partially allocated by race and where efforts to reduce environmental risks and the effects of environmental disasters are most vigorous and effective for white folk. Now, when you start thinking from there about the big environmental elephant in the room, climate change today, and think about it primarily as a problem of carbon pollution and downstream effects of carbon pollution, the degree to which all the inputs, effects, and even the benefits of climate change are shared equally, that's environmental justice. Apply it to climate and we call it climate justice. We could go one step further and describe the paradigm where climate pollution is not created equally by race, where both the long-term acute risk of climate change and climate disaster tend to be assigned to people of color, we might be able to describe that system, what happens now, as climate racism. But for the sake of ease and for provocation, what I want to present to you today is the idea that we should just refer to climate racism as the status quo. Our social and economic systems create a setup where climate change does not, indeed cannot, affect people of different races equally. It is what it is. Now, this might be where, at least five years ago, if I were in an actual lecture hall, uh, this might be where I would start to see some confused faces. I don't know. The, the understandings have changed so rapidly that I might be behind times. Everyone here might already be, be with me. If, if You might believe that, uh, that a steady state of uh, at least racial inequality is part of the, the, the climate uh, paradigm in the world. But this is where I'm used to having real pushback. Uh, the way most of us have been taught about climate change, usually the way it's been portrayed in media warnings about it for years, is that of this immense, titanic, disastrous change on the horizon coming for all of us. Even now, when we communicate about uh, limiting global warming to various thresholds under two degrees Celsius, we speak in terms of this you know, big grand we, something that we as humanity have to do. And we fret about the fate of humanity as a species. Wealthy people, wealthy white folks especially, love to fret about the moral implications of having children, worrying about those kids being doomed to living on this hellscape of a future planet. Climate communicators often use language like, we're all in this together, and we've only got one planet to highlight the global shared risk that we all face and the shared responsibility that we must take on in fighting this outcome. But, you know, that's not really how it works in the world. Um, it's not how it's happening. We've got ample evidence that the actual distribution of global heat, uh, which when you think about it, is a primary consequence of climate change, is concentrated among poorer countries. And it is the foundation for all the other climate effects that we have. It's not some future problem either. Heat waves are already more and more deadly in developing countries. And some places with the highest populations in the world and also the poorest populations in the world, they already see hotter and hotter nights and temperatures approaching the outer limit of human uh, uh, of our ability to uh, live in places. Even here in the United States, heat is already more of a burden for poor workers especially poor Black and Latino farm workers across the southern half of the country. Kidney disease from dehydration and overheating among Latino field workers is on the rise. It's approaching an epidemic, not something we talk about in the age of COVID, but one of the rising causes of death and disability among people in the South was this surge of kidney disease that is likely tied to heat and dehydration. We also know that mysterious kidney failures, faintings, and heart disease across the world appear to be linked to heat and pollution. We know that in cities, poor neighborhoods of color tend to be hotter and more dense. They have more concrete and glass that retain in and reflect heat with fewer uh, cooling green spaces than wealthier, wider areas. We also know that climate disruption is fueling humanitarian crises in Central America that then spur migration northward uh, where people are discriminated against in Northern countries. We know that pipelines and nuclear waste sites plague indigenous nations in the United States. Uh, 
and that flooding from hurricanes appears to disproportionately hurt older Black communities and accelerates land loss within them. And again, these are not all far off future reckonings and things we have to worry about in a generation. We saw these dynamics shape reality during Hurricane Sandy in 2012, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico in 2017, during heat waves in the South in 2019, during rainy day floods in Maryland in 2019, and right now as cities like Miami fight sea level rise. These are dynamics already in place in lots of our metropolitan areas. On an economic level, it's also already clear that climate-linked catastrophes act as vertical wealth transfers from black and Latino to white, from poor to middle class to wealthy, from renters to landlords, from individual homeowners to Wall Street, and then the United States from South to North. In fact, uh, if you look at this slide that I have on the screen, there's plenty of data now showing that wealthy white people in this country actually see wealth increases uh, after big climate-driven disasters. Now, this is from a study in 2019. It shows that black communities uh, uh, that are start, that we start uh, studying black communities in 1999, those black communities in 1999 with lower incomes and education actually see a long-term wealth decrease if they get more FEMA aid money because of a severe disaster. But in white, more highly educated communities that see more FEMA money, again, because of the severity of a disaster, the white communities that are devastated by disaster actually tend to see their overall wealth increase over time. To maybe oversimplify all this, white communities are able to recover from disasters while the same exact events tend to be death blows for black communities. When you think about all this from a big picture climate context, it all becomes abundantly clear that we, we are not really all in this together. Wealthy countries and their industries and politics led by billionaires and other elites created the lion's share of our current global emissions problem. Today, wealthy white communities tend to lead the world in consumption and per capita emissions. But those same communities do not face the same climate consequences as neighbors who are people of color or have fewer resources. They have greater resilience. Uh, they tend to be sited in safer and less marginal areas. And they're more readily given uh, aid, government aid, and more government help when disasters do arrive. Now, obviously, or runaway climate change in the future will, was not gonna be great for any of us. Um, it's gonna be bad enough to make life worse even for the wealthiest among us. But we have no reason to believe that it won't always operate primarily along a gradient of inequality. And that gradient will always in turn create a pretty awful feedback loop where the places and communities sheltered from climate change will become more and more valuable and less accessible as life everywhere else gets less comfortable and more dangerous. Climate injustice, climate inequality is the way things are. We live in a state that trends towards this kind of catastrophe as an ultimate expression of underlying inequality. Now, I hope I've done what I need to, to set everything up um, because I really want to get back into the history. Again, you know, I love history. Um, and the present structure and incentives of journalism and what they say about how we describe reality and communicate the urgency of the state of the climate catastrophe before us. In short, I believe that mainstream journalism, journalism is built on top of principles and professional and ethical foundation uh, that is difficult, that make it difficult to accurately describe the reality of climate change and lead us to bad descriptions of the problem and then to worse solutions. And again, I think some of the key for that is going back to 1927. It might surprise you to learn that a coherent understanding of journalistic objectivity as an industry standard, uh, that it's only about a century old. Up until the 20th century, news and opinion regularly rub shoulders with no hard line between the two in our newspapers, um, there was often just flat out falsehoods in news articles and partisan politics were openly present, present even in hard news coverage. There was not a whole lot of attempts to get rid of it um, up until maybe the very early 1900s. Uh, 
the late 1800s were the heyday of what lots of people refer to as yellow journalism. And from that time on through World War I and uh, coverage of things like the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, propaganda was presented in our newspapers non-controversially as fact. Now, you know, this is a state of affairs, a description of a state of affairs that is loose. Uh, some, some places did do better than others back then at having a factual basis for their journalism. And I don't want to present our current time as one uh, devoid of problems in terms of uh, accepting government propaganda as fact and being totally fact, factually accurate. Uh, but in all, lots of things that we take for granted in the field, like trying to do independent investigation of government claims and getting comment from multiple sources, these were not necessarily norms across the industry of journalism until the, the, the early 1900s. The guy in the picture on the slide here, he helped change some of that. That's Walter Lippmann. He's a founding editor of the New Republic and he's considered a giant in uh, journalism and media criticism. In 1920, he released a review of New York Times coverage uh, and general media coverage of the Bolshevik revolution in Russia and found that it was essentially propaganda masquerading as fact. Uh, this report helped stress some things in the industry as it professionalized, like fact-checking and the thought of using the scientific method and its ability to identify and control for bias. It was a really big report that absolutely changed uh, how lots of the industry worked. Through the middle of the century, the big newspapers like the Times of, and other big newspapers like, the, like it, they would create uh, new standards based on the premises of that report. And they found that uh, taking those premises a step further, uh, when more and more newspapers sought national audiences, they found that getting rid of their point of view kind of also helped attract more advertisers and developed more national readership across partisan and regional lines. But to be blunt about it, in a time when uh, lots of people in the country did not believe that Black people should vote, did not believe in interracial marriage, did not believe that Black people should even be able to drink in the same water fountains as them, uh, there was a pretty blunt moral calculation here. Uh, journalistic outlets avoided offending those people and those advertisers uh, by refusing to accurately report on the motives behind racial injustices and refuse to interview Black people about them. So that created uh, a standard of objectivity that we carry with us today uh, that was kind of based in an imperative to not offend racist viewers and racist consumers. The news media of 1927, when the great Mississippi flood happened, it was basically stuck between the old paradigm of media and the new paradigm of a objective uh, professionalized landscape. It was still caught in the tail end of the open propaganda era, uh, but in the beginnings of the time of realization that this kind of neutralized, potentially uh, neutralized racially objective uh, coverage regarding racial issues was a good money-making position. You can see how those two styles clashed in the newspaper articles of, that covered the Great Flood of 1927. According to John M. Barry, the author of Rising Tide, which uh, I told you all to, to read as much as you can about 1927, if you, if, you want, if you want to jam on it like I do, it's a great book about it. Uh, one reason why mainstream reports were so dismissive of the unequal effects of the flood by race and the misery that black victims faced was because the officials they relied on for information, they themselves were dismissive. They often just straight up lied about the conditions in forced labor camps. There was little will to independently investigate what was taken as official record. On the other hand, that suited all the newspapers just fine. They didn't want to ask hard questions about how black people were being treated because they knew that would put off their readership. They what sold papers in the South, and again, this happened in the South, was not stories of injustices done to Black folks or items that might be critical of the planters and the big businessmen who ran the camps. It was stories of criminality and the fact that people got that criminality under control by putting Black people to work. The catastrophe narrative then that served those stories was one that viewed the effects of this major flood as universally devastating. 
They were all in it together. There were no disparities in who suffered most. That view turned the wealthier and white folks who survived and, and who made it out of this, this disaster, it turned them into industrious paragons of American resilience and can-do spirit. They survived something that they could not be expected to survive. Uh, but it meant that black victims, the people who were made, who didn't have houses months after the flood, the people who ended up being dependent on government aid, who needed jobs, who died, who suffered from cholera in the aftermath, it meant they were somehow uniquely deficient, that they were lazy looking for handouts and perhaps even deserving of the bondage uh, by those uh, people who had succeeded. It goes without saying that I think a, a lot of these same problems still co color our coverage of the climate crisis today. The, you know, I uh, talked a lot about objectivity and non-bias and this, what we call view from nowhere. Those are things that really took off throughout the 20th century and have become problems in our coverage of climate change today. In matters of race uh, and also climate change, uh, we like to consider the views of know-nothings, of trolls and of bigots in equal regard to uh, empirical fact and eyewitness accounts. And when climate change uh, or big disasters do merit coverage in today's media, the, the kind of coverage that they often get ignores underlying social conditions in search of universality, in search of us talking about how we're all in this together and we overcame, in search of narratives about resilience and togetherness. It's all very seductive and powerful. Uh, you can see it everywhere. You can see it in the kind of reporting that we had immediately after Hurricane Katrina, for example, it happened during Hurricane Maria. It, it happens when we talk about resilience after forest fires. We're taught to look for sensation and to to hype up and amp up uh, feel-good stories after that sensation runs its course. Uh, and careful considerations of social dynamics and policy and inequality, they don't really pay the bills for journalists. Now, this creates the illusion that climate change is not primarily a problem of inequality, that there aren't winners or losers, and that the people who do end up suffering most from climate problems are essentially responsible for their own salvation. Media narratives will always tend toward a view of climate change as this newly emergent phenomenon, not something that's based in our history and co social context, and not something that's happening now and been happening for years. It always treats it as something that's new and shiny and inexplicable and uh, not one that's not the sum total of our economic and political choices. Most narratives cannot by nature implicate our current way of life beyond the most gentle critiques of consumption and of offering green ways uh, to commute and buy clothes. And the media creates this narrative and maintains it. And it, one of the biggest impediments, I believe, to us understanding the true nature of climate change, which is one that, which is that it's a story of injustice, a story of inequality. Now, this is my uh, favorite slide to go to, because I love Ida B. Wells. Uh, and I think the modern field of journalism is kind of patterned on uh, the, the modern field of investigative journalism and its best practices are founded on her life's work. Um, I know there are a lot of really smart people, both coming at this from the climate science side and the journalism side, who want to make journalism better and more responsive at talking about inequality, talking about racial justice, and uh, when, we, when we discuss climate change, uh, there are journalists who endeavor to cover environmental and climate injustices and who know the science of emissions as well as they know the history of redlining in cities. More and more editors and publications, as I said earlier, they have warmed to this view. Uh, this, again, would have been unfathomable 10 years ago, but there are awards and fellowships and training programs for environmental justice and journalism now. But I think there's still so much more to do and so much of our old way of thinking that gets in the way of using journalism to inform people about what's really going on. There are lots of people who, who kind of believe that we need to scrap everything that we've done in journalism and create something new that is more responsive to our current climate uh, paradigm. But actually, uh, as maybe you can see from all the historical sides I've used here, I think there's a lot we can learn from looking back. I don't think we have to create some new journalism craft construct that's never been tried before uh, 
that will somehow magically help us face the greatest problem of social and economic policy, perhaps in modern history. Rather, I think we can look at how Black newspapers especially were handling the Great Flood of 1927. They, in contrast to all the mainstream outlets that like to minimize the stories of brutality, the stories of injustice, the stories of economic and social, social conditions that were the foundation for the Great Flood, they operated using an entirely different paradigm. And they held that the facade of total objectivity was impossible. How could it be when they were Black journalists covering violence against Black people, when they were Black journalists in Jim Crow America who were unable to even use water fountains uh, that other people used, when they had to stop in the back of gas stations on their way to go cover these stories, when they faced the immediate threat of bodily harm just to follow their, their, their daily wire stories. They had no illusion of the fact that they were part of the story. <laughs> there, there was no way to think about it otherwise. They had a duty to their communities, and they often made no attempt to hide that fact. But despite being part of the story, they were never keen to accept official narratives at face value. And they were the people doing most of the official pushback against the government uh, line, against government officials, against people in the camps, uh, against the people who were doing, who should have been doing meaningful oversight. They were clear early on that Black communities would be hit hardest by floods because they knew they lived in those communities. They assumed a framework where environmental injustice was already a given because it was part of the common sense experiences that they and other people they knew had already lived. And as reporters working in a world that assumed them inferior, they knew how to create work that was beyond reproach in terms of rigor and accuracy. They built on the methods of people like Ida B. Wells, uh, who was an early investigative reporter and who inspired lots of their work. And she and others who followed her method combined really things that I think are critical to good investigative journalism today. They, they combined deep empathy, a familiarity with their subjects, with Black people, and a subjective presence, a sense of duty, a healthy and earned skepticism of authority, and uh, they covered things that were both sudden catastrophes and also manifestations of underlying racial justice structures. They never treated them as emergent conditions. They treated them as manifestations of long and slow violence. They invented a lot of these methods, not because they liked inventing things, but because these were the only ways that they could hold power to account as Black journalists. They were the only way they could uncover lynchings, unmask Klansmen, and take a big picture look at the way power and money were concentrated in a deep South that was inherently hostile to their intentions. In 1927, those tools proved to be just what the Black community, and indeed the world, needed to understand what really was happening in the flood and how environmental collapse and existing inequalities were linked. Now, you know, we do not have, unfortunately, a Black press uh, in the way that we did in 1927. A vast majority, even more so than uh, the current uh, erasure of local, main, of local newspapers across America, a vast majority of all the old Black newspapers, they're gone. Um, and um, they're not really coming back, I don't think. But I do think there are ways we can apply what they did, what they learned, and what they were to our current climate journalism. Uh, first of all, addressing their absence. We have to figure out a way to step in and do the things they were doing. I don't know if we can recreate those titles, recreate the coverage they had. We had hundreds of Black newspapers in the 1920s. We don't have that same uh, uh, presence today. Uh, but what we can do is create real substantial public investment in community serving and community owned journalism especially in minority and frontline communities. That's what I believe our first goal should be. It would help equip us to understand what's going on in those communities generally, and also understand what's happening in terms of the climate crisis there. This kind of locally driven media could also be a source of vital training for storytellers who might become the next I.W. Wells's, uh, and of promoting the idea that journalism on climate change isn't just something for well-educated young white reporters, uh, 
Um, I think Sunshine alluded to this pretty brilliantly early on, uh, but climate journalism is for everyone who is affected by climate change, which is to say everyone. <laughs> Community ownership and publicly funded training would also actually help undercut what are lots of uh, conflicts of interest in our current climate change reporting. We have lots of advertisers who are uh, from big oil. We have lots of people who run grants, who, who give out grants, um, who give out training uh, money, who are tied to anti-climate uh, awareness uh, aligned groups. We have people who in this current uh, maelstrom of, I would say disingenuous uh, discomfort with critical race theory, who will push back against the idea that we should cover climate as an equality problem. Community ownership and public funding would help become a bulwark against these, uh, these, these impediments. And it also might give journalists a little freedom from the imperatives of clicks, advertising, and sponsorships, which often tend to favor really sexy, sensationalist, universalistic climate change narratives, and they get us off track. But beyond the structural things, I think there's a broader lesson about journalistic ethics that we take from 1927 too. It's not really possible, I believe, to expect an unbiased view from nowhere uh, on an issue that affects the survival of billions on this planet, including many of our future descendants. It was similarly impossible to expect the same of Black journalists covering Jim Crow. They really could not afford the naivete of not deeply grounding stories about major events in history. It was impossible for them to write about people in old plantation towns being flooded and sent to camps without considering the history of those old plantation towns and how it still shaped life there. They assumed that every single problem and every single story would in some way interact with deep layers of white supremacy. They knew that inequality was not incidental to environmental degradation, but one and the same. Essentially, they created environmental justice beat decades before we even had a term for it, decades before I knew about it, decades before the first people protesting in North Carolina created the term environmental racism. Now, I know based on the title of this lecture, based on the first slide here, that my solutions might be a bit of a letdown. Uh, I think I might have sold the idea that I was expected to uh, reinvent uh, the wheel live on air. And I do apologize for the misdirection. I genuinely did come into the old line of inquiry, thinking of new things that I might be able to add uh, to the way we cover climate change and emphasize the crisis of climate injustice. But everywhere I turned in my research, the answer was already there. Just as environmental injustice has been a reality in America since, really since settlers first pushed indigenous communities to off prime land and into the swamps, the ways of understanding and explaining the world, they're already there, they've been continually present. They just might not be in the places we are usually taught to look, in the labs and the institutes we consider most prestigious, or in the institutions and newsroom that we take as our gold standards. But the tools are there, and we got to find and use them fast before things get much worse. Now I'm going to open, open up the floor for questions. Uh, I know I went a little long, but I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Van. This was just fantastic. And um, I, I don't feel like you sold us a bill of goods in terms of what you promised. No, this uh, quite the contrary was was really exciting um, and provocative, which is exactly what we we're looking for. So um, I, I'm going to start off with a question here from Chris, who asks, do you find coverage of the, the so-called climate resilience movement to be problematic? Resilience can at times seem to favor just building bigger seawalls, which favors the rich who can pay for such things. So I think there's no way around the fact that uh, we will have to focus on uh, resilience and, and other uh, pieces of the mitigation uh, puzzle, other pieces of the learning to live with it puzzle, because some aspects of uh, global warming and climate change are already baked in. Uh, the, the sea levels are going to rise. Uh, we're gonna to have to figure out uh, how we prioritize our resources in endangered communities, um, but we are gonna to have to do things to increase the resilience of communities. Um, I think where we run into problems is where we uh, don't have a strict 
dedication to equality in those conversations. When we aren't talking about uh, the ways that communities are already made uh, less than resilient by current policy and how to get to a foundation where we can start talking about, okay, uh, you know, citing seawalls. We can't talk about seawalls until we talk about uh, the fact that wetlands, uh, degradation of wetlands has uniquely disadvantaged uh, low income populations of color on the coast right now. We can't talk about, you know, big walls and big levees until we discuss those things. And I think uh, when you have a, uh, an ethos that uh, necess necess necessitates that we repair as we build these new uh, functions of uh, resilience, then I think you, you start heading towards the right direction. Thank you. Um, we, I want to be sure, since you are an editor, um, to get your thoughts on what, how, what the role of editors and other, you know, kind of gatekeepers in the journalism industry is in addressing these gaps in coverage. Well, insofar as uh, editors, uh, the editors who have hiring power, that's the number one thing. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it is a moral imperative. Uh, not, I mean, I think everybody would say that diversity is imperative of hiring managers everywhere now. Uh, but going beyond just the numbers and, and, and thinking about how we ensure coverage from communities that are affected, uh, how we ensure that when we do hire people, when we do hire people from frontline communities, that they are um, adequately uh, cared for, mentored, uh, given professional development in our newsrooms, how they are able to use their voice and their unique gifts and talents uh, toward creating a, a, a new and useful climate narrative in our, in our journalism. It doesn't make sense for me to hire um, diverse populations and then to uh, not uh, encourage those new hires to uh, bring their new perspectives and voices into how we shape, how, how the journalism we make is actually made. Um, so those are two things I think editors uh, have to be doing right now. It's both the hiring aspect and also empowering the people that are hired um, to be meaningful uh, contributors to not just the journalism, but how we think about, how we strategize, how we shape that journalism. Right. Thank you. And also, yeah, I think the question was talking about language, too. Um, yeah, you know, when we think about uh, the creation of style guides, the creation of uh, house voice, uh, whether we even use terms like climate justice and environmental justice, it is on the editors to make sure that they are really, you know, blazing trails here, that they are at the forefront, that they are leading um, and listening to the signals from people who are affected most and incorporating that feedback into their decisions on that front. Well, we have a question that is a perfect follow-up to this um, from an anonymous person who I'm going to guess is a reporter who asks, um, often leadership in newsrooms are not from black or brown communities. Do you have advice for reporters looking to push back on how editors change language or lack understanding of the importance of, of centering these communities and environmental and climate coverage? So I think one thing that has helped me, um, and you know, these are not necessarily hostile conversations all the time, it's just always making sure that you are uh, pushing for the most accurate, the most, uh, the language is the most reflective of what's happening on the ground um, and making sure people are aware. But what's useful in that push is always uh, making sure you are aware of the other institutional resources out there for you. So now there are um, people developing good and useful style guides on how we cover um, not just environmental problems and environmental justice, but racial justice, um, how we talk about people who are affected by uh, big societal problems. There are people who are thinking um, much higher levels than I can think about it, uh, who can provide you sort of uh, backup we can provide you materials. Uh, and, and one thing that I think is, is also useful is when you start doing uh, reporting in areas that are affected, I'd just like to get a temperature check from the people there about what you know about 
the Atlantic. What you know about where I work, you know, what have you read in this publication? And um, those informal surveys, are we, are we serving you? Are we providing a, a news product that's useful to you? Those surveys that I, you know, are often more important to me than what I get in terms of official quotes and sourcing. They help me learn exactly how to uh, bring those things back to management, to, to, to the people who create our house voice and our priorities and let them know how people are interfacing with what we do in the world. Uh, and, and that's something I found really enriching and useful uh, in my own work. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I wonder if there are um, specific um, news outlets that, that you think are covering the, um, the issues of racial injustice, specifically with regard to climate, especially well? Um, well, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, tell everybody to go get a subscription to The Atlantic. I think we do pretty well. Um, and uh, there are people who are, you know, closer towards the tip of that spear, though. There are, uh, I think, Grist is doing great work. Um, you know, obviously, these are, you know, they're places that specialize in this type of reporting. You got Grist, you got Earther that's uh, doing all right. You got lots of new um, collectives of journalists of color who are doing more indie work. Um, you've got, I think, uh, there's great new environmental justice work and a new environmental justice desk at Inside Climate News, um, which is a nonprofit newsroom. Uh, I think uh, we are in the middle of a uh, kind of a new uh, time of focus on, on this. Um, there, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't like doing lists of places. I always miss, I always miss out on some places I love to read. Um, but I, what I will say is, uh, I think lots of uh, places that do feature climate coverage, that do feature environmental uh, coverage, they are making some meaningful efforts uh, at reframing it in terms of justice. Great. Yeah, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot on the list, but it um, just seems like you had some really great insights here to share on that. Um, I want to, so again, another reporting related question comes from Gaitha, um, who asks, what role could campus newspapers play in addressing some of these complexities? Oh, so I love this question because it's, it's something that I like to uh, make sure that I always stress to student journalists, especially, campus newspapers are local newspapers. And they are the you know, local newspapers that I believe are uniquely insulated in some cases from lots of the larger industry forces that are erasing uh, local newspapers. So I think they have a duty in some cases to, uh, to expand their footprint a bit and to think about what's happening in the, the immediate communities surrounding them. To, to, to try and fill some of the roles that for-profit journalism around them may not be able to because they don't have enough subscribers. Um, university towns, there's always a, a lot of push and pull between the, you know, the moral role of the, universe, of, the, of the university in the surrounding town. Um, but I think this is one place where that role can be made pretty clear. And it is uh, student newspapers, campus newspapers, a variety of different media organizations and uh, publications that are on campuses. Uh, we can think more rigorously about how to use them as community anchors. And then uh, I think that they become, uh, since they, you know, I think one good thing also about campus newspapers is they often have really impeccable uh, archives. And then they can become these newspapers of record about this problem that we consult generations down the road. That's true of some papers already. I think, uh, let's say, the Daily Tar Heel in, in uh, North Carolina. And I'm not just shouting out uh, my, uh, you know, my university's newspaper, but I think they do a good job at this, at covering what's happening in surrounding areas, especially in uh, disadvantaged communities around them. Thank you. That's a, that is a brilliant note for us to end on. Um, a really inspiring call to action among our important campus newspapers out there. I would like to conclude by just thanking you, Van, for a really fantastic lecture today and um, helping us think about how to do this work better.
Um, I also thank all of you for joining us today and I hope that you will tune in again tomorrow um, and, and the rest of this week as we continue this lecture series. Um, you'll see that there's a link in the chat where you can go to register for the upcoming lectures if you haven't already. And with that, I um, bid you all a good day and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.